Welcome everybody to the season finale, the final episode of the Undisrupted Season 3 podcast. Adam, uh, we've had an interesting season this year, and I think it's, what's really interesting is, you know, that you, our perspectives is so unique, because I now, I used to work in a school district, but now I don't. You work in a school district, and, but both of us have done several things, uh, been to several events together and all of that, and I think what's mm-hmm. always interesting is office politics um, and, and what role they play when it comes to technology leaders that are out there listening to this, um, those of you out there that are maybe uh, going and speaking or going to events or presenting or, or even attending things. Um, I always experienced, uh, it depended, I had a lot of support, obviously, from a lot of my administration of a lot of the things I did, but I also experienced little bits of professional jealousy or organizational jealousy. Did you ever, yeah. and I know you and I have both taught in many districts, so any, what's your thoughts on office politics when it comes to that? And then, of course, the tech leader's role in all of it. Here's the funny thing. I, when I got to this role, I was like, okay, I don't want to become a superintendent. Uh, and I said that because it, I felt that role was so political, you know, like it, sitting in the superintendent seat is such a political role. But then reality hit me. And any point you leave the classroom, these roles become political, whether you're talking about an AP, a, a principal, or a coordinator or director of technology there are some politics that are in here. You know, it's, it's all political, if you will. It, you know, when you start talking about getting things approved in your budget, uh, it could be something as simple as wanting to upgrade a computer lab. You have to make sure you have the right people on board, have those back channel conversations and all that stuff. And it's, it, you know, it, it, that's one of those things you have to be aware of. And then also you do have that professional jealousy to, in, in some cases where, if you are good at what you do and people are singing your praises outside of your system, there are going to be some people who are kind of feel some kind of way about that, that are within your district. Not that it happened to me in my district at all. You know, anybody who works in my district, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about those other people in those other districts that I worked in, but not the one I'm currently working in now. <laughs> well, that's good that you say that because now on Springer, we have what? behind the curtain, Jennifer Williams, Dr. Jennifer Williams, the instructional technology coordinator at Newton County. Oh, oh. look, surprise, surprise. So Jennifer, <laughs> I'm going to bring you into this. Now tell me what, how much of a pain is it to have someone like Dr. Adam File to, to work for and be around and who has a loud personality and wears loud clothes <laughs> and shoes. Yes. Logic. Oh my goodness. I could barely concentrate. <laughs> now look at I'm wearing all black today. I mean, so I know like, very mean understated. What do you mean loud personality and colors. <laughs> so how is it working for him? Uh, I know you guys go known each other for quite a long time, and of course, you're. Uh, we know that we all know those of us that know anything about about your school district know that you actually run everything. But uh... <laughs> he gets all the credit, and I do all the work. See? I write emails, yeah. and he tells me to forward to them, forward them to him, and then he sends it out like he wrote it. This is like this is a good expose happening right now. This is a, <laughs> behind the curtains of office politics. See, see. And so for see. those for those who are watching this uh, video, you can see the wonderful office space that I provided for her, <laughs> and she's talking about things. I mean, like she had like a corner That's office. This small. <laughs> <laughs> she has a corner office with a window. There's like you know luxury. <sighs> Thanks curtains. to Kendra Scott for my decorations. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Those of you who can't see that are listening on the podcast, we've got an amazing virtual background happening right now. I think Adam paid 99 cents for that virtual background. <laughs> <laughs> free and 99. Scout it from the internet for free. Free 99. Free, free 99. 99. Those of you who know me, free 99. Well, it's I'm, quite entertaining working with Dr. File every day. I can tell you that no day is the same. I, uh, I, you know, luckily for me, I don't work in a school district, so I'm sure Adam couldn't dig up anybody, but. <laughs> oh, 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 you, you want to go there, Carl. I can find someone. Give Uh-oh. me a second. Um, how I, I found someone who is very pretty. Oh, so pretty. This is a whole, this is a whole nother discussion. <laughs> Let me bring to the stage. Now we're going through all kinds of politics. All kinds of politics here. (laughs) Ms. Brianna Hodges, welcome to the show. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Carl, Mr. Carl, may I speak, Mr. Carl? Uh, Can I take off my headphones for this? (laughs) (laughs) No, you have to be live in living color for all of this. We're going to air all kinds of laundry. It'll be great. This is good drama. 
So give us the background about working with somebody like uh, Mr. Carl Hooker, who believes that he's a big deal. I kind of am. Yeah. <laughs> well, he he is a big deal. I mean, he has stature. If you if you haven't been in person with with Mr. Hooker, he definitely has stature, and he uh, he likes to own the room. Um, definitely definitely steps in, lets people know he is there, and. Uh, takes up a lot of space. And if you're not ready to, to listen, he'll just talk louder. And so, yeah. so that works pretty well on that <laughs> end, but uh, you know, he, he finds, he finds a way of making, making people listen to him and, uh, and to, to say yes to things that, that they find themselves kind of confused that they did indeed say yes after it was all said and done. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting situation. Like, like my like my friend, Dr. Jennifer. I uh, I did. I cannot say that I had a, the most amazing uh, abode provided. It was definitely uh, you know we had nothing on a, a frat house bachelor party kind of office. Um, uh, yes. Lots of skulls and crossbones <laughs> and uh, uh, and zombies. Right. Like yes. I think that was that was our welcoming office and some uh, duct taped together furniture. Yes. Yeah. And you had a window. I mean, I put you were so, going to look out yeah, the window. Definitely at least. a good time. Yeah. Definitely a good time. There. <laughs> well, I did. I got getting... to look out a window. I couldn't open the window. <laughs> <laughs> That's for oh, that the was... windows don't open here either, girl. If it's a fire, we're just going to die. <laughs> so they're, they're sealed shut. <laughs> <laughs> all these windows in the background carl can talk mm -hmm. to you about setting fires <laughs> what so, what is so has oh, your no. has your co-worker ever set a fire in the office <sighs> no 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 i've been safe from that <laughs> i forgot oh, about that well carl could speak into maybe maybe potentially having the fire department called into into our office at I one was, point in time I was, I was trying to ignite the excitement of learning and uh <laughs> it, it went overboard i should quickly point out too at this moment that the reason why we're recording this today then we were supposed to record this last week but brianna got stuck in an escalator everybody oh my God, yes you're gonna tell yeah. them oh, yes. you said you said in an elevator right no escalator an el escalator yeah those of you watching and in we an do this escalator in an escalator we could do a photo. We can there have a photo be, pop up. We'll have a photo a, evidence of this for sure. <laughs> so there should be a sign at the top of the escalators, you know, maybe a hundred feet in front of the escalators that say, do not wear a maxi dress or skirt and stand on the edge because you could find yourself on the last step of an escalator. And I don't know, you know, step forward and then suddenly find that that you have some resistance in moving forward. And you know, this is very similar to, to what we're talking about, like in digital learning and in nice. technology, right? Like sometimes you're just moving right along. You might even be coasting downhill, right? And you're about to take that step to move forward and suddenly you're stuck and you find yourself, you know, looking around and um, we happen to be at the, uh, at the, the, Digital Learning Annual Conference, the DLAC uh, there in Austin. And um, right at lunchtime, as my, my skirt found itself stuck in the escalator, uh, the, the, uh, the hotel staff was incredible. They um, hit the emergency button. I got to stand there in a crouched position. So I got to work on a, on a leg day um, that I wasn't quite planning on, but uh, they, were, they were fantastic. So um, I can't complain there, but the, the whole being stuck thing is definitely, it was, it was interesting because people were very understanding. Like they didn't really, they weren't bothered the fact that I was like standing there um, until they got right next to me. And then they all almost without a fail, every single person that walked past me was like, oh my gosh, you're stuck. And I was like, yeah, it's not a big deal. And so I had all kinds of offers of frosty beverages hey, or okay. you know, offers to go get um, staff or, or things like that. So it turned out okay. Uh, I think it all in all, it was about a... 10, 15 minute ordeal. Um, and uh, they, they were able to pull the skirt out, but it did kind of eat the bottom of my skirt. But uh, yeah, yeah. So that, I can check that one off the list. When Being stuck on an escalator. I did not think I would ever have that on my, on my bucket list of the summer. So there you go.
And you knew that there was that whole video of the guy being stuck on the escalator that we see at all the professional learning stuff that like that had to come up right away. Like, how do I get off of here? Or we're gonna have to make sure that our video editors put the actual yes, photo yes, up uh, on the YouTube channel. So those of you that are watching this on YouTube, hopefully right now you'll see a picture of Brie, video evidence, photo evidence of Brie stuck on the escalator. Uh, something that I never thought humanly possible. <laughs> all right. So speaking of kind of being stuck. Uh... Yeah, but hey. <laughs> We're gonna, I'm going to switch it a little bit on this one and get a, get a little serious, if I can, with this oh. next question to uh, Jennifer and Bree. Um, since we have uh, two women who are killing it in the uh, area of technology, um, how do you see things moving or being able to help more women uh, get more leadership roles in ed tech? Because as we see, this is a male-dominated profession. Um, majority white male dominated profession, yep. but how do we see moving and getting more women in cabinet level roles in positions in technology? Jennifer? I know for me, I was dumbfounded when I went to Cosin. I <laughs> felt like I was a unicorn at Cosin. Yeah. And um, I had never even really heard of Cosin before. And um, Adam took me, he was like, hey, you're coming with me. He's always, that's one thing I have to give him props on. He teaches me so many different things. So he'll say, I'm doing this, come here. And I'm like, I don't want to do this. And he's like, you're going to do it anyway. We're going to Colson. And I'm like, oh boy, I'm going to be around a whole bunch of stuffy people. And there were a lot of stuffy people. And I felt like <laughs> a unicorn. I looked around and I was like one of three black women at the whole conference, the whole three days. And every time I found somebody, I was like, <gasps> Yeah, yeah, you had that color purple moment um, at one point when you saw that one black lady. It's kind of like you kind of like, like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I, and then there were, um, there were not that many women either. Maybe ten percent of the crowd was women. And I thought to myself, nationally, we are underrepresented. Um, not only are women underrepresented, but women minorities are underrepresented, and it felt bad. And it felt like I was in elementary school again, where I was mm. the only black girl in the gifted program. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Why don't more women um, go for jobs in technology? And I think a big deal is about at, when you're in a teacher and you're in education, no one tells you. No one says, hey, there's this thing that's opening up. There's no cohorts for us. There are no courses that are, say, okay, this is going to help you with technology and help you move forward. We're all pushed into the loving roles of taking care of the pre-K children and taking care of the students. But in as far as technology, I happened upon this career by mistake. Someone else who they offered the position to, to do something in technology was like, I have too much on my plate. And then they were like, oh, Jennifer likes technology. She could do it. Wow. And if it wasn't for Adam, then I probably wouldn't be sitting here either because he's like, oh, let me show you this. Let me show you this cool thing. So in technology, I always think about why are we always women thought of last as if we can't put, you know, a monitor and some mice in, in especially in instructional technology. Why aren't we thought about first? Mm -hmm. Why are men always the go-to people? Even when you're thinking about jobs and hiring, when you're looking through resumes and you're trying to find people, I mean, all the men apply. Women shy away from it. And that's mm. because we have been coaxed to, to be soft and that this is not what we want to do. And we're not smart enough to do these things. And it's starting, like research shows, that starting in fourth grade, females stop being interested in those computer science classes. So we now have to be really intentional by making it a something that, hey, these are women. We're doing technology. And in our district, I know that's one big thing that Adam, as a male, pushes, let the girls see you, let the girls hear you, let them hear from you, let's start programs where our girls are brought to the forefront of technology. And I'll, I'm going to get Bree to comment on this too. I think uh, when we, I think about my own early teaching career, and you're absolutely right, Jennifer, there was times where I had no idea about anything with technology. I knew that the internet was around, but because I was the only male on an elementary campus, what had happened is it just people just started saying, well, you must be the tech person. I'm like, why? I'm like, well, because you're a guy. And it was weird. I was like, I, I'm not really, I mean, I guess I'll start learning about it. I'll figure it out. But I think in some ways you're right. And Bree and I have encountered many a time where we were working on a project or something 
and they would turn to me to ask for feedback on something. And I'm like, she's the one leading this thing. And why are you guys asking? And it was just like an assumption. It was very frustrating for me. I can only imagine what she went through with it. Um, but I'll let her chime in on this too, uh, with her lead her ship as, as it is. <laughs> well, I think, you know, I want to echo Jennifer's comments. I mean, I think that, that there is such underrepresentation. Um, First and foremost, and for women, most especially for women of color and um, and and uh, underrepresented um, minorities, things of all all that nature. Um, and I do think that you know, in that we also experience a lot of the challenges around the scarcity, you know, the the seats at the table, all of these different pieces that um, cross over right from from our a lot of our equity conversations into um, into these elements. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to hop over um, to to kind of carry forward what Jennifer was um, was saying before I jump into the to the leadership piece, but I think it does kind of like cross into it as well is around you know when we where do these jobs get posted? Where are they talked about? All of that kind of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I think that that's one of the the pieces that um, we run into all the time in HR conversations, whether it's through an equity lens, whether it's through technology lens, um, you know, whether it's uh, um, gender equity or or racial equity, talking through how many people apply, right? And, and Carl, you and I have had this conversation before where, um, you know, we talk about, from a, from a female standpoint, whenever we see that job posting, we will look at the requirements, right? And, um, and, and Jen, you and I can have this, you know, I can, I already know, uh, I have feeling where, where your answer will be, but um, if we see, you know, the 10 requirements that are on that posting, how many as women do we believe that we have to have before we'll put our name into that hat? Jen, how many do you think we have to have? I took a I Am Remarkable training and I'm a, I am a remarkable facilitator. We will say two in a minute. We'll, we'll say, oh, we have to have all 10 of these requirements to apply for a job. But a man will have one or two and will apply yes. for the job and get it. Exactly. Exactly. And they think that that is because, you know, it's like, I always joke because men are like, well, I mean, those are suggestions, right? Like that's those, that's just things that they think they want. And we can, you know, we can process and talk through them. And part of that is, is our female, um, you know, what has been ex you know, expressed to us and expected of us around the word requirement and qualifications and, and all of those things, right? Like it is, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of this notion of perfection based on gender moving into this. Girls are expected to, you know, really truly lean into that, uh, you know, look the part, be the part, you know, if you have all of these things about you, then that means that you're going to be qualified in this way and you'll, and you'll be able to do that. And, um, and so that kind of sets up that perspective already. So we have women that aren't feeling like they're qualified for it. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not putting in for it. Those that do decide to step forward, if they are not a recipient of that job, if they're not selected for that job, most often the feedback is that's provided to the females is, well, you didn't have enough of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then we put forward again that phrase of not enough. Um, you weren't qualified for this. And so it just ripped that completely out instead of, you know, really kind of leaning in. And I'm not saying that every female needs to be hired for a job, but what I am saying is that we need to be very specific in our feedback. We need to say, this is, you know, this is where we saw, you know, this, this, show the difference in the candidates. This is why we went with this decision. You know, um, that said, we feel that you are in, you know, down, going down the right track. We really want to support you moving forward, you know, different things like that. Give women, you know, give people in general, but especially women, a reason to believe that they are in the right field and that we want to encourage them to stay in there. If this isn't their time to shine in that, if this isn't the role for them, try to find a way to help them stay with the course, not just here, oh, you're not enough, which we then process is, oh, you suck, get the, you know, get, get out of it completely, right? And so I think that there's so much of that that happens. And, and I mean, I don't know, like, I, I want to have, I want to hear from, from Adam and Carl on that. I mean, 
in your brain, like if you don't get selected for a role, what happens in your world? Are you just kind of like, Psh, they're lost, like they don't know what they're missing? Or do you, you know, grab some peanut butter ice cream and like sit on the couch <laughs> and really kind of process that through? They're watching some Gilmore Girls, you know. Yeah. Wrong, yeah. Well, well, you know, it's one of those things, a lot of times in that scenario, I, if I look at who was hired instead of me, um, and this is one thing being, uh, and being a minority and me personally speaking, I, you know, I run through the checklist when I look at who was hired, I'm like, okay, did, cause more than likely I know the person, you know, this, our worlds are so small. We all inter intersect with everyone. So it's like, okay, well, yeah. You know, if Carl got the job, I'm like, okay, yeah, Carl knows his stuff. He's tight. You know what? Um, you know, he probably was a toss up and they went with him. But if I see someone who I know their reputation, I know their skill set, and I'm like, they got, they got hurt. Like, all right, then maybe I'm thinking, okay, maybe it was some relationships they had. Maybe they already had in their mind who went, they weren't to hire um, going into this whole scenario. Yeah, and in my in my framework, it's a it's almost a different mindset. I I've always been a believer that if something happens, it happens for a reason. There's fate to a lot of it, and I always think about what other opportunities have just opened up because I didn't get that job, or what other opportunities can I create? And like I fought for years to get a TED talk. I was like, oh, that was my end goal in life. I want a TED talk. I want a TED talk. And my wife would hear about it every day, and it's like, and I would figure out ways to get in. I kept getting rejected. I was never allowed on stage, and so finally I said, you know what? I'm just going to create a space where I can have a microphone because as Bree mentioned, whenever I go into a room, I need that microphone anyway, because <laughs> I have to just talk to everybody. I was like, rather than waiting for someone else to accept me into their space, I'm going to create my own space. Now, some of that is afforded because I happen to be a white male in education. And I know that. And I know that in a lot of ways, that gives me opportunities that others don't. So what I think after I made that space, what did I do? I want to make sure that I get other people of different, mm -hmm. uh, different genders, different races in those spaces as well. So if you ever looked at when we ran our events, I was always trying to make sure that people that are under underrepresented were at least up more on stage, because I feel like that's just, we don't see that enough. Now it's starting to happen a lot more All luckily. Right. I feel like conferences are figuring it out that there's a lot of amazing people out there and they don't have to look like me. They can look like, mm -hmm. they can look like anybody else. And um, so I think in that sense, it's getting better, but I'll go to one other thing back to Brie on that. And that was, uh, it, it was an eye-opening moment for me when she and I were talking about travel and, uh, you know, speaking and going out and things like that. And, and, and the pushback that she was getting um, just socially, not necessarily from office politics, but from people that were like, well, but who's going to watch the kids? And, and I thought about how crazy is that, that that is the way that society has set things up that, well, when I go and travel, it's like, oh, good for you. Go out there and get, you know, go out and get those, get those <laughs> jobs. But when it's Brie, it's like, man, who's going to watch the kids? You know, is, is your husband going to babysit them or, you know, and, and that, <laughs> that drives my own wife crazy. And, and she and Brie are good friends. So they know this, they go back and forth on this a lot. Um, I, I didn't realize what a societal impact that had on, on women in these roles too, in terms of what you're doing. I think Jen kind of alluded to it too, in terms of you know, what do you see, what you see out there, what, what people assume that you can do based on your gender. But I, I don't know, Bree, you might want to hit on that too. But I mean, I think that was, that was one of the most eye-opening things, conversations we ever had is when you told me that and I was floored. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for me, it, it's so funny because it, being in a, from a small town, um, you know, it is one of those pieces where you, you hear it, um, especially in a conservative area, right? Like it's, it's the, um, that's not a, a normal um, gendered role, right? For, for the woman to be traveling while um, small kids are at home and, and all of those different pieces. And, um, you know, we've, we've, we often talk about how education is a predominantly female um, uh, industry. Well, that's true for educators, for teachers that are in the classroom. And, um, but that goes significantly, um, you know, the, the inverted triangle goes significantly the other way when you start, as, as you start moving through leadership. And, um, and then it starts to be that, uh, you know, Oh my goodness! And now it's it's all these men and um and and I've had that conversation with several um with several thought leaders that are men that are fathers that are like well I don't ever get that and I'm like well you never are You're like no one ever ever is gonna come to you and tell you because they're looking at you as someone who is supporting their family and who is doing all of that if um you know if a woman um is gone for a few days it's looked at like we just locked them in the house with a 
a box full of Cheerios and said, um, Godspeed and good luck. We hope you come out whenever, you know, whenever I, I'm, whenever I get back, I hope you're still there. And that's not at all what happens, but um, that's what's, that's what's thought of. It's thought of us as like abandoning our kids that we're not um, as, uh, as committed to being mothers, um, which, you know, I, the three of you know, my, uh, my abhorrence for the word balance, um, especially when it comes to, to life and work. And, and part of that is because it is impossible to maintain a true balance, right? All, you know, if you have more than one child, you can't be balanced in the in the attention that you give to your children, um, because on some level, one child is going to need more than the other child is, and that's going to flip back and forth. And when you add in a third one, you add in a fourth one, you know, all of those different things, it's, it's not pie, right? Like it's not always going to be balanced and fair. Um, but I do think that that's really interesting. And it goes back into those, those opportunities, right? Like, you know, kind of going back to your original question of what happens, how do we get more women um, specifically involved in this? Well, one of the things that often happens as we move into leadership, as we move, you know, along in those careers is travel opportunities and, um, and late nights and working, you know, in different circumstances. And a lot of times, um, if men are in that position, they will assume that women aren't willing to miss that opportunity, you know, miss that time away from their, their kids or that, that they're not aware of that. And so that's not something that they're willing to do. Um, a lot of times, and I, I've been in those rooms where men are making the ultimate decision and they are raising those questions and they're like, well, why does this person want to take this role when this is what it's going to mean, you know, against them? And it's like, did you ever ask the man that came in and applied for this job that, you know, did you clear with him that he's going to be missing, you know, these amount of days and that he's not going to be there for that, uh, you know, for that ballet recital or for that football game or, or whatever the case is. And they're like, well, no, he knew what he was getting into. Well, he has the same job description that she has. So if he knows, I'm pretty sure she does as well. And, you know, don't try to make these decisions for them. And, um, you know, again, it comes back to how do we help recruit people for these roles that we know are are going to do a great job um, and are going to you know bring in the energy and the experience and the enthusiasm for these roles how do we start recruiting that instead of just leaving it on paper and then letting the odds which let's face it the odds become a buddy or 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 right. a, um, a a network or a a cohort of whoever's doing that so Jen, I'll throw that to you. I was going to say that brings me to the thought. How do we fix that? Thought. Yeah, how do we fix this? Well, that brings me to the thought of now we're all being equity informed, right? So you think of equity just in this terms of race, but equity in terms of gender also, because we're all, you know, think of that picture that you see and the kid is on the box. You know, is there a box for us that we're standing on to kind of get us to that equal playing ground? Are you making things at conferences available for parents? For women who want to, you know, I need to go check on my kids and is there some time um, in place for me for that? Are you just setting everything up for a single male to be able to go or a, somebody who's available who doesn't have child care? Because when you think about it, um, even in this building where I work at, this bathroom is not equitable. <laughs> there are two men who work on this floor. <laughs> <laughs> they pretty much get a stall to themselves. There are 72 women. Yeah, mine share... actually has his name on it. I actually have my name on my stall. <laughs> they share four stalls. By the time 10 o'clock comes around, it is nothing pretty in there. <laughs> there is not an equitable distribution of resources. Not in this building, not in our office, and definitely not when you go to conferences and you are out there doing work, you know. We're sitting there and, and we go to ISTE. The line is 200 people waiting in line to go to the restroom and you miss your session each time, you know? So we're constantly having to fight for just everyday rights to go to the restroom, let alone everyday rights to teach and learn and to be out here, you know? And like Bree said, when we're out here, people are asking, well, where are your kids? And who's watching your child? And what's going on at home? And it's like, okay, well, I have a job and my husband is watching his kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, why do know, I have to watch her all the time? And Jennifer, you know, we joke about this sometimes, and this is within our own office space, um, and how there's no uh, space for women who are nursing. 
uh, how many times have we had to give up our office space or something? Just being nice because it's like a, a workshop going on and somebody's like, hey, I got, I need to pump. Okay, so they'll put up the butcher block on the door or whatever. When it's be so simple for them to put up something as simple as little, little nursing pods in, mm -hmm. in an office space. I mean, something mm -hmm. that simple, um, but it goes back to what we we're saying. A lot of these leadership roles are men. And so if I'm a man and I'm the superintendent or the deputy superintendent or over facilities, that's not anything that's on my mind. But even if you are a woman in that role, you still have to be mindful of it because sometimes and we can be our own worst enemies. When I say me, we, I mean the, the minority group, when there's someone in that position, you try to sometimes overcompensate and not do things for that subgroup that's been underrepresented. Uh, there's a simple thing, and I know this happened to you, Jennifer, and I'm going to tell this quick story. Um, with, I was with Bree and, and Carl. We were all at a conference sitting at a table. Oh, boy. And uh, this was we at their Learn Fest event, <laughs> similar to we have one called Teach for Tomorrow that we do for our teachers. Nowhere near on, uh, on the grandiose scale of uh, what Carl has done in the past. Uh, but <laughs> he, uh, Carl did this opening thing on stage. Uh, Brie came out there, did her opening thing on the stage, and we were back in the green room sitting down. I'm working on a, a session uh, slide later. This lady comes over there, you know, she didn't say anything to me, didn't know me. She talks to Carl. Oh, great job out there, Carl. You're awesome. You're amazing. You 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 spoke and everyone listened. I felt my heart just a flutter with the words coming out of your mouth. <laughs> and then looks over at Brie and she was like, Brie, you were so pretty up there. Oh. And that was that's what that was my joke earlier when I when I mentioned her being pretty. It was and that's our that's our running joke behind that because that woman, I mean, but in her mind, mm -hmm. she was complimenting Brie with the, at the same level, but with her, it was calling her pretty. And you know, and I know Jennifer, you've, I, you we've been around places before, and I've seen her cut her eyes at things. <laughs> and and for those of you who don't know Jennifer, she is from New York. Where in New she York is. exactly, Jennifer? Brooklyn. 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 So, Brooklyn. She is Brooklyn in, a, in Georgia. So that Brooklyn Don't comes out of the Don't fool you today. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was just so awkward because I caught, I caught it when that lady said that. And I kind of did a, gave like Carl. A we all looked eye. down. Yeah, we all shifted in our seats uncomfortably and we're like, wow, what do we say? Uh, that was, uh, and Breed, what do you, uh, what was your, I mean, Again, we had what followed the next 45 minutes was an amazing conversation, which is extremely it was one of the most beneficial conversations of my lifetime, just sitting there listening to you guys talk about it, honestly. Um, yeah, I wish we could have recorded it. Uh, what well, was your and I was, was I take? mean, Adam, Adam and I didn't. Yeah, Adam and I didn't know each other that well at that point. And I, I will never forget it because um, after after that woman walked off, you know, Adam's sitting there and he kind of looks up a little bit. and He's like, Bree. I said, yes, sir. And he was like, are you as offended for you as I am for you? And I said, Adam, I will never, ever, ever in a million years stand here as a white woman with blonde hair and pretend to have any sort of like similarity to the experience as you as a black man from the South experience. But every damn day, Adam, every damn day, somebody <laughs> has to make some kind of comment about how I am a woman in, in this role. And, you know, it's and, and it's that part of, you know, again, and I, I, Jen, I love that you said that it's that it's that experience of equity, because if you are in a circumstance of privilege and whatever that is, whether it's as a gender privilege, whether it's as a race privilege, as a as an economic privilege, whatever the case may be, it's sometimes really difficult to see that. And it, it meant so much to me that that Adam and Carl, you know, recognized it in that moment. Um, and it wasn't and, you know, and it's funny because then when you have this conversation with other people, uh, especially men, they're like, well, I mean, didn't you look at them and are like, damn straight I am, you know, and I was like, no, no, no. See, that's not it because what it implies is that the only reason why you're in this role is because of the way that you look, not because of your ability to lead or your expertise or, you know, all of these other elements. And, um, you know, it's, it's, but it was, it was so great because in this conversation that, that ensued, you know, after this, um, we started talking about, especially in the South, you know, how a lot of times we as women, um, we, we tell each other, hey, if you don't know what to say to somebody else, like always try to make them comfortable. And if all else fails, compliment them on something, like tell them their shoes are cute or their earrings are pretty or, or whatever, but just mm -hmm. try to, to let them know that you see them. 
<laughs> and it's it's so funny because it's that part where you're like, and what are we trying to teach people to like just be, you know, it's that fine line between am I being welcoming and nice or am I just searching for something, right? Like, and that's totally not at all what we want to do, you know? And then I think that conversation like then led us into, um, Adam, we were talking about, you know, your, you with your daughters and how daughters shouldn't be put in that situation, especially as kids to like, we always, you know, like if somebody wants to give them a hug, like we shouldn't be telling them, Hey, give them a hug. Like if they don't want to, they shouldn't have to, right? Like nobody's trying to tell them to be disrespectful, but we also want them to be respectful of, of their bodies and of their, you know, their intelligence and their, you know, all of those different pieces. And so I think for me, like it was just such a great conversation and really dug into what do we as society set up around, you know, around all of these stigmas? And, um, you know, that, that if you are, if you, if you look a certain way, or if you are a certain color, like I, I was a part of an equity group um, last summer. And uh, one of my favorite questions, it was one of the first questions that we asked. I was one of only, um, I think I was one of only three white people in this group. And, um, and one of the questions that was asked really early on was how, what is your first memory of knowing your, your skin color? And, um, and it was really interesting to listen to everyone. Like I said, we had, we had this very diverse group, um, of, of, you know, representative of multiple ethnicities and, and skin colors, but, uh, it was, it was interesting to go around and listen. And, um, and so one was an older, um, an older gentleman, he was in his, his sixties black man from South Carolina. And he said, you know, it was being called in and, uh, having like all of his, um, having all of his, his grades questioned and he was being asked who he was cheating off of because there was no way that a, a black kid could have the grades that he had without cheating, right? Like that was the implication. And another one shared about how he was, uh, he had transferred to a new school and now all of a sudden, all the the coaches were coming and asking him you know what what sport he played and what position he played even though he didn't do anything but it was just assumed that as a as a black kid he was automatically athletic and um you know it was it was just really interesting like listening to all of these people share based around the social stigmas of of color and of gender um that that we place on them and i think that it's so hard for us to see that ourselves when we're in that position of privilege until all of a sudden it flips, right? So like as a white woman, I might not see it from my race immediately, but I might see it from my gender immediately. And, um, you know, and then, and, and to be able to have those conversations and, and lean into it and realize like, wow, this is, these are all these different ways that we set up, um, we set up our circumstances to benefit the privilege that we experience, right? So like if I'm a white male who's in a leadership role and I'm drafting the job description, I am unconsciously, you know, subconsciously um, drafting it to benefit, you know, based on my experience. And, um, and, and so how do we step back and open our, our, our um, you know, our aperture a whole lot more to get everybody else um, weighing in on that so that we can broaden that base as it goes through. Re, that that kind of sets us up for our la for the last question we're going to ask, and I'm gonna throw this one over to Jen first. Uh, normally, this is the part at the show where I ask our guests how or a tip or a trick or thing that they can give to the audience to keep them undisrupted. But this time, I'm gonna change it up a little bit. But what we've been talking about, what is uh, one tip that you could give someone who sits in a, a leadership seat to disrupt? the norms that we currently have with some of these gender uh, biases, some of these racial and um, biases that we see in these roles. So give us one tip, uh, Jennifer, that you would like to share with someone. If you could talk to a superintendent, a tech director, CIO, CTO, whatever the case may be to disrupt this, these norms that we currently have. I mean, the biggest tip I can give is to make sure that you make opportunities. Now that you have the power, um, it's, your, it's in your hands make an opportunity for someone who is not like you. So if there is, you know, I know when we choose speakers for our 
Teach for Tomorrow conference or anything, I'm always looking for someone who looks like the children in our district. I want to make sure that everybody sees a reflection of themselves. So, if, you know, when you look at who you're looking for, I want to make sure that people see themselves. You know, representation is so powerful. The first time I decided that I wanted to do something in technology is because I saw someone who looked like me and said, ooh, look what she's doing. When I look at the Girls Who Code and um, those programs that are being run, I see the women there and I'm like, wow, these are women who don't look like me, but someone who looks like them is looking up and saying, wow. This woman right here, I can do this. And I'm going to end it with this thing. We had a conference, a Cold Like a Girl conference. And one of the girls, you remember this, Adam? One of the girls um, said, I said, did you enjoy today? How was everything? She was like, I never thought that I could be a coder. And it's a fourth grade girl. And I said, why? She said, I've never seen one. I never knew what they would look like. And I'm like, they look like you. And she was like, (laughs) like me. And I'm like, yes. And she said, Oh, so I can be a coder. And it was like, if you would have saw the light bulb go off in her eyes and she just was like, I can be a coder. Like that was so far from her reach. So then stopping and turning around and making sure that we continue programs and or start programs to encourage it. So we have we have all these um, different cohorts, right? Do we really need another reading cohort? I don't think so. I think reading teachers, there's a lot of them. Maybe there could be a technology teacher's cohort or a teaching leader. Oh, we have something like that, don't we? Um, (laughs) There could be a cohort where we start something for people who want to be tech leaders in our district who are, we're real specific and intentional. We're looking for females who are interested in learning how to use technology. We're looking for females who are interested in learning how to be data administrators. We're looking for female network engineers and making sure that we're real specific and intentional in hiring them. Wow. I love that. I love that. That is impressive stuff. So my one tip, like quick tip would be do not ask the female in the room to take notes um, during the meeting. And I'm not, I'm saying that with a complete and total straight face. Like it is almost without a doubt, like a hundred percent, if you walk into any kind of meeting, especially a leadership meeting, um, especially if it is, you know, led by a a male that it is going to be assumed that the the woman in the room um, will take the notes. Um, And the challenge with that is that you immediately then remove her from the conversation. And, um, you know, it, it, it would be much better to allow uh, someone else to shine in that way and take, uh, take, those, um, take those notes and, uh, and give that female um, an opportunity to then, to then shine into, um, into it in a, in a different way and lean into that. Uh, the, uh, the, the other part of that that I would say is um, remember that um, that the things that women are doing um, to distinguish themselves in those roles are are oftentimes not seen because they're um, they they they're not being appreciated for that. And what I mean by that is um, research has shown that women who basically are told like, Hey, I know that you, because again, obviously you're so good at this because you're a female and that's, you know, innate into your DNA, you're going to plan the, um, Christmas exchange or the, uh, baby shower that we need to have coming up or any of that kind of stuff. And so it'll be done. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of like, that's the sunshine committee chair person that ends up becoming, uh, you know, it, it often begins is delegated to to that woman. Um, Oftentimes the female that's put into that position will accept it um, a little bit begrudgingly, uh, but because she's thinking that she's gonna be a team player and that it's going to be noted for for her boss that she's putting in this extra time, um, she's gonna take it and she's gonna do it. Uh, What research has shown is that when review time comes in, that female that has done all of those extra duties is actually not seen at all for any of those things because her boss actually expected that. Like she, he, he saw that as something that she was good at. And so like, that's just part of her nature. That's what she does. 
The opposite is true whenever a man takes on that role, um, doing the exact same things that the female did in that situation. When his time comes up for his review, that's going to be pointed to, and it's because that wasn't something that was seen in his, um, you know, in his his natural bag of tricks. Like that was something that was seen out of the norm for him, and so it's really seen as that that situation where, wow, you are being a team player, and we want to um, reward you for that. So, uh, I, you know, basically what I would say as this tip is don't anticipate that what is a gender specific assumption around roles is actually true to the people that you have and instead allow their talents to shine in the ways that um, that they naturally will lead you towards so so give them those opportunities again Jen you said it so so well create those opportunities for people to shine and, um, and, and to lead in new and innovative ways so that we can truly disrupt um, the learning situations and circumstances that, that we're facing as we move forward. Well, speaking for Adam, I will say that uh, the talent of you two ladies is very much appreciated uh, over our careers and that we continue to feel uh, tremendous value by being friends with you guys. And also love that you keep us in check uh, when we get a little bit out of line, which happens quite often. Um, but that said, uh, we wanna, I wanna thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, she's Brianna Hodges. You can follow her on Twitter at bhodgesedu. She's Jennifer Williams, Dr. Jennifer Williams. You can follow her at right right now, which is W-R-I-T-E-R-I-G-H-T -E underscore N-O-W uh, on Twitter as well. Um, you like to follow, write, Jennifer? She does like to write and do poetry. <laughs> If you have a chance, look at all three of the of the folks on this call have all done some sort of poetry that is on YouTube somewhere. Or, so you have to look that up. <laughs> um, <laughs> include yourself in there. <laughs> that's right. Oh yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> thank you all again. Thank you for all of our listeners out there for joining us. Uh, be sure to subscribe, give us a review. We might even give you a shout out on a future show. This has been the Undisrupted Podcast brought to you by Future Ready Schools. He's Adam and you can follow him on Twitter at askadam3. And he's Carl, and you can follow him at Mr. Hooker. Remember, everyone, we are better together. And we are better undisrupted. undisrupted. Except for in this case, where we want to disrupt in some <laughs> yes. <way>. yes. <laughs> this podcast is made possible by the generous support of Amazon Web Services.